My name is Glenn Milner, and I've been asked to introduce Jim and Shelly Douglas. Naturally, I've taken this uh, very seriously. For those who don't know Shelly and Jim, uh, they're longtime activists in this area and all their lives, actually, for peace and justice. In 1977, they founded the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action in Paulsville, Washington where they worked on issues of nonviolence, nuclear weapons, and the Trident submarine system. In 1989, Shelley and Jim moved to Birmingham, Alabama to track trains carrying nuclear weapons across the United States. In 1993, Shelley and Jim founded Mary's House, a Catholic worker house of hospitality for homeless families in Birmingham, which they still maintain today. Since the early 1990s, Jim and Shelley Douglas have made seven trips to Iraq in resistance to the Persian Gulf War, economic sanctions against Iraq, and the ongoing Iraq War. Since 1996, Jim has been researching and writing about the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X. The Douglases have put their lives in addressing the questions of our times. How shall we live as disciples of Jesus? How do we live nonviolently? How do we take personal responsibility for our government's actions and for our own? The Douglases consistently have put their beliefs into practice. My deepest thanks to uh, Shelley and Jim Douglas uh, for speaking to us today. I'd like to thank Ann for having us, having us here. Uh, for many in the Puget Sound region, resistance to nuclear weaponry in our area has been a defining period in our lives. It has, has for me. For most, that challenge has been put before us by Shelley and Jim Douglas and others involved in the Trident resistance. And for that, I'll forever be grateful to Shelley and Jim. Uh, my friends. Good evening. I'm Shelley. <laughs> oh, we've, we've spent the whole week in uh, Lacey, Washington, talking about the four assassinations of the 60s, the Gospel of John, and how we live today. And we've focused mostly on uh, the war in Iraq and the arms race and nuclear weapons, in particular the Trident. And I thought maybe tonight um, I at least could share a little bit about the other side of the arms race, which we're also all familiar with. The, the human face uh, of the cost of the arms race. I think somebody just turned this up. Is that good? <laughs> okay. When uh, Jim and I moved to Birmingham, one thing we hoped to do was to connect the lack of human services for people in poverty with the amount of money that was being spent to build weapons like the Trident system. And Birmingham was kind of the perfect illustration because in Birmingham, the white train, the nuclear train, and the missile motor trains uh, all sat overnight or longer in the downtown area of the city where, of course, the poor people also lived, uh, primarily also people of color in Birmingham. And we thought that was such a graphic illustration of what was happening as we built nuclear weapons and siphoned funds off from human needs to build the weapons. So it seemed to us like the perfect issue and the perfect place to address it. What happened, a lot of you know the story, we, we had been in Birmingham for two years when uh, the train stopped running. And we uh, found through Freedom of Information Act documents that the DOE had decided there was too much protest to ship the trains on, to ship the weapons on trains anymore. And they were putting them instead on trucks on the freeway, which made us feel a lot better. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, 
in personal terms, that left us sitting in inner city Birmingham, kind of saying, all right, now what? <laughs> what are we supposed to be here for if it's not uh, tracking these trains? And eventually, through um, mainly through our little church where people came looking for help with hospitality, we, we decided that perhaps the call at that point for us was to open a house uh, for families because there wasn't hospitality in Birmingham for families if there was a father present or a son over 10, uh, which is actually still largely true. So we began to uh, look for money and then we found a house and we opened this house that we called Mary's House which is in on the west side of the city of Birmingham, a uh, little further out than most of the civil rights action took place. And we live in this neighborhood called Ensley. And Ensley is the kind of neighborhood that when we have a work party with the wealthy white parishes that are what we call over the mountain outside of our, our little inner city, uh, the parents of the kids who come in to do work in the yard or you know, paint the house or whatever, call up every hour or so to make sure their kids haven't been shot. <laughs> and every once in a while we get a parent who suddenly realizes where their kids are and drives in from the suburbs and picks the kids up and leaves <laughs> um, because our neighborhood has such a bad reputation. I'm not actually convinced that it's a lot more violent than most of the other neighborhoods, but we get the news coverage. so. Now, we're part of a little African-American uh, Catholic church, uh, probably maybe two, 250 families, maybe a holy family. And that church um, has an elementary school and a high school, had the first hospital in the city to serve African-American people, which is closed because everything else now is open. We're a, what they call a changing neighborhood, which when we moved in there meant that the houses were all falling apart and being torn down and kind of devastated and trashed and that people who had the money were going as fast as they could to the other side of the mountain. We have a big project there called Tuxedo. Where anybody remember Tuxedo Junction, the song? Well, Tuxedo Junction is right, <laughs> is right there uh, where we are. When you get off the freeway, you pass Tuxedo Junction on the way down to Mary's house and the Tuxedo Project and Tuxedo Elementary School are all right there. So where we are has been all, well, since we moved to Birmingham, really, we've been in the other side of the arms race, kind of on the, the human side of the arms race where the money isn't going, that's going for the weapons. And of course, recently, more and more funding has been cut uh, more and more services are being withdrawn and people where we live are suffering more and more. The, um, our project is now about to be torn down. It's already been emptied out. And it's going to be what they call a Hope 6 project. Does anybody you know what those are? They come in and they tear down the low-income housing, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but then they build uh, mixed-income housing and in the first project where they did that in Birmingham, we had started out with 600 units of low-income affordable housing and wound up with 200. So that's 400 families who had affordable housing who don't anymore. And the proportion will be the same in Tuxedo Project, whether the numbers are the same or not. So now our property values are beginning to go up. Um, They've kind of abandoned all the housing stock in the area, and every day when I walk to Mass, I walk by and see that it's been further trashed. Um, people are taking all the siding off, they take the windows out, they pull the wiring out of the wall, I think to sell, um, to get drug money. But nobody cares anymore because it's all going to be developed. It's all going to be made into middle to upper income places. And the people who are living there now who are in despair are maybe going to be still in the same neighborhood on the streets or maybe they'll be moved somewhere else. Um, nobody really knows. Because nobody's got a plan for what's gonna happen to them. A lot of the people in our church 
um, have taken what they regarded originally as kind of weekend or summer jobs with the military. Um, it's very common in Alabama. Of course, we have very low income per capita, and people don't make much at work. So lots and lots and lots of people sign up for the reserves or the National Guard so that they can make some extra money. You know, and most of them, when they signed up, never thought about going to war. They thought about maybe going for flood relief or hurricane relief in Florida or, you know, going away for training over the weekend, something like that. And all of a sudden now they've been being called up and sent to the Middle East where they have to shoot at people. And people shoot at them and people blow them up. And um, in these little parishes like we belong to, a lot of times both parents are gone. And there'll be <clears throat> little kids who are left to be taken care of by the grandparents or the friends or whoever's still home because the war has pulled off all the adults. Um, it's just the kids left and the you know, older folks. So in a lot of ways, um, our neighborhood is continually devastated by the cost of the war and behind that, the arms race. And in the middle of it, uh, we sit, our parish, our little house, um, Mary's house, you know, we named it after Mary, the mother of God, because we thought, well, they were, the Holy Family was refugees and homeless and they had to go to Egypt and we figured, well, she would know what these women are going through and uh, so we would name it after her. And, uh, and the women really do go through that and so do the men. But we've, we've been talking um, all week about the Gospel of John and the kind of situation that Jesus uh, lived in when he walked the earth, which was really a very similar situation of international domination, of imperial power, of poor people getting poorer, and the power structure uh, profiting from that. And we've been talking about, well, how what was Jesus' response and how the people of his time were disappointed in him because it wasn't a violent response. That what they were expecting was a Messiah who would come in on a, you know, a horse with a sword and defeat the Romans and put the Jewish nation on top. And instead, uh, what Jesus did was to announce that his kingdom, or his kingdom, as McAllister likes to call it the kingdom, was not of this system, not of this world, translated system, and in fact, he told Pilate, um, if my kingdom were of this system, my followers would be fighting. But it isn't. And so they're not fighting. It's a kingdom of a different system. And we spent time in Lacey looking at the way Jesus lived. We were working with the Gospel of John, so we worked primarily with um, the stories in the Gospel of John, how he included the excluded, like the Samaritan woman, um, how he healed, how he did civil disobedience by healing on the Sabbath, for example, um, putting human concerns above the law. And two important things. Um, his example for how to live in this system was to be inclusive and to be healing and to share, as he did when he fed the multitudes. But before he was betrayed, the night before he was betrayed, at the Last Supper, which most of us think of, at least I do, in terms of uh, bread and wine and sharing the meal, in the Gospel of John, he doesn't do that at all. Um, he washes all the disciples' feet. And he says, this is his example. And of course, washing feet is a pretty menial task even now, but at the time it was even worse. And only the lowliest servants would do that, but Jesus did that for the disciples uh, in his own day and told them to do likewise. And the, the really instructive thing for us is that when he washed their feet, they were all there, including Judas, who hadn't left yet. So when he included, when he washed the feet of the disciples, he included the person who was about to betray him, to be executed. And then later on in the garden, remember when all the soldiers and everybody come to arrest him, Peter, who's a little bit slow as always, um, grabs a sword and cuts off the ear. Remember he goes to, to war, he cuts off the ear of the 
high priest's servant, and Jesus, what, heals the ear. So his response is to include the traitor and to heal the person who is arresting him. It's a kind of a total nonviolent response that speaks not to overturning the power structure, but to including and converting. So that at Ground Zero, for example, when we began it, um, one of our great hopes was the people in the Trident base, because the whole Trident campaign germinated through one man, the man who designed the Trident weapon system, Bob Aldridge, who told us about it and said, okay, here, what are you going to do? He had resigned his job in, in uh, response to knowing that. And as we've worked uh, through the Trident campaign, through things that happen in Birmingham, the people who are able to help us most are often the people on the other side. And they're also the people who need our community most and whose community we need most. So we were talking this afternoon about the direction for the non, wither nonviolence, where should the peace movement go? And Jim and I looked at each other when we saw the title and said, well, we don't know. <laughs> don't ask us. <laughs> but how, how we should go. Um, we should go loving everybody as best we can, and it's not easy, including the people who seem most divorced or most hostile to us because that's the only way that we all come out together in a new community. So I think we, we don't have any particular words of wisdom except the same old, same old thing, which is that uh, we have to remain together and we have to love each other and we have to serve each other. And the, the people, you know, Gandhi used to say that before you do something, think about the poorest person you've ever met and try and understand if what you're about to do will improve their lot any, will do anything for them, will it help them. And uh, that's a pretty stringent kind of test to put our actions to, but, but as we talk about disarmament and the threat of world destruction, I think it's really important not to be forgetting all the people who are being destroyed now by the armaments, whether they're ever used or not. Uh, people who are in prisons and in drug treatment centers and in all the places where people are when they live in despair. So I just hope that uh, we can keep all those folks in mind as we do our struggling with the arms system and, uh, and be linked into that community as well. I was looking at the, uh, the title, um, <coughs> Transforming Truth. Um, the first part of the title, and um, that is a um, that's a title that basically for me means Mohandas Gandhi um, transforming truth, transforming truth, and it means apart from his life, which is transforming. Um, it means the process that he gave us, um, which is transforming, that he describes by his um, autobiography title, The Story of My Experiments in Truth. And Shelley and I have understood um, a number of, well, practically everything we've done in terms of both Jesus and Gandhi. And in one sense, we've been experimenting in truth with Jesus' teachings. So the process, to a very large degree, comes from Gandhi, and the, um, the vision actually comes from both of them, but uh, the vision comes initially and primarily from Jesus, but the process comes from Gandhi. Um, since we've moved from this part of the country to Birmingham, um, as Shelley said, we've 
moved into a situation where we've seen the other side of the arms race, which was our purpose, one of our purposes. Part of our purpose was, as she said, to um, live alongside the tracks of the trains, the same trains whose tracks we lived alongside of um, by the Trident base. But the second part of even that component um, was to see what was on the other side of the tracks and on the other side of the arms race. Um, and since we've moved to Birmingham, at Mary's house, we've seen a great deal of that, which she has uh, described in Ensley, in our church, Holy Family Catholic Church, which is in the midst of, besides Mary's house, this church is in the midst of very, very um, difficult living conditions for anybody. So that's the other side of the arms race. And then something um, I've, been in, I've been involved in for the last nine years has been the other side of the other side of the arms race. And the other side of the other side of the arms race is invisible to us, just as the other side of the arms race is invisible to us. And the other side of the other side of the arms race is the way in which our government keeps us from dealing with any side of the arms race. Domestically, as in countries out there, by very shrewdly and circumspectly and with amazing to me now that I know a little bit about it, um, planning, um, blocking any significant social change in this country. I was introduced to that side, the other side of the other side of the arms race through Dr. King and his assassination um, many years ago, 1968. He died April 4, as you know, 1968. But although that event had an enormous impact on my life because my students responded to it in our class at the University of Hawaii by burning their draft cards, going to jail for months or years, depending on which student was involved, and inviting me into their community, which was called the Hawaii Resistance. So I had to walk a little bit the talk that I did in our class. Um, nevertheless, I did not understand Dr. King's assassination. Um, I understood the sacrifice, I understood the gift of life that he gave, but I did not understand the process by which his life was taken. I did read the last book he ever wrote, which he more did more in this form. Uh, it was a series of radio lectures over the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. It was called uh, Tribune of Conscience. And when I read that book, I thought, because he envisioned um, stopping the functioning of Washington, D.C., and cities across this country and across the world as a process of nonviolent change, which is a very massive revolutionary process, I thought this man was probably not killed by a lone assassin named James Earl Ray. What he had in mind, which was more immediately the Poor People's Campaign, 
to disrupt the functioning of Washington until the Congress would eliminate poverty from the United States, which is always within our reach, but not within our choice. Um, that was a vision that was, even to someone as naive as myself, intolerable to the powers that be. So I began to suspect very strongly, just from reading that book, that there was a lot more involved in what killed him. Then in the 1990s, when we were living in Birmingham, um, I began to read some things and eventually about his death and eventually attend hearings about his death in Memphis, Tennessee, and finally attend a trial for six weeks um, in November, from November 15th to December 8th, 1999, just culminating as the Battle of Seattle took place. So while I would see the Battle of Seattle, as it was called, <laughs> um, on the media at night, I would go to, in the day to the courtroom and see the Battle of Memphis in 1967 and 1968, and they were the same battle. They were the same battle. And Dr. King was alive and well in the community that was working to resist the World Trade Organization, including a number of you, probably. I'm sure, I know, actually. Um, and he was alive and well in that courtroom in terms of um, what I heard there from his co-workers as the reasons why he was killed. And the specific reasons were given by 70 witnesses who included uh, people testifying to the culpability, not the culpability, but the actual responsibility of the United States government. And the jury of six blacks and six whites in this wrongful death lawsuit initiated by the King family, all of whom sat at one point or other. There was always a member of the King family in the courtroom from beginning to end, um, with very eloquent testimony from all of them. Um, that trial resulted in a conclusion by those six blacks and six whites that the government agencies of the United States were involved in the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. A verdict that um, you can read all about at kingcenter.com. Um, the whole trial is on record in, uh, at the King Center archive or website in Atlanta. And ever since then, that trial especially, I've been trying to understand the other side of the other side of the arms race in relation also to Malcolm X, who is the other side of the vision of Dr. King at the end of his life. Malcolm died in 65, February 21, 1965. But if you follow the history of Dr. King after Malcolm's death, he was Malcolmized. He went into, as you know, the Chicago ghetto. He lived there. <clears throat> and the whole vision that Malcolm was responding to in the northern cities, which King up to then had responded to in the southern uh, dimensions of racism, King took on. And at the very end, the militancy of Malcolm had come home to King. And in his resistance to the Vietnam War, which he took on one year to the day before his death, and in his um, vision of disrupting uh, those cities until our country and government in particular came to terms with economic racism and the destruction of the poor in this country and across the world, that was a Malcolm vision as well as a King vision. It really was. And Malcolm's vision at the end of internationalizing the resistance to racism, because racism is international be to begin with, making civil rights human rights. King was taking on all of that at the end of his life. But Malcolm was earlier than King on that particular issue. 
taking civil rights to human rights, that was a Malcolm vision. That was why he was killed. At the last, in the last seven months of his life, four and a half of them were not in this country. They were in Africa. He was the best known American in Africa in 1964, um, <clears throat> after the Mecca experience where <laughs> he embraced traditional Islam, he met with leader after leader after leader throughout Africa in order to bring the United States to court in the United Nations alongside South Africa for violation of the rights of 22 million African American people. And he had the support of the leadership of the newly liberated countries of Africa. He was the only American permitted to attend the Organization of African Unity in Cairo in August 1964. The government of the United States wanted to send an observer. They were not allowed to. The leaders of Africa said, we'll invite Malcolm X, not the US government. That was the kind of person he had become at that time. And he was poisoned in Cairo by a man whom he recognized when after he had been rushed to the hospital, he realized the waiter who gave him that was someone he knew from New York City who had been smuggled in as a waiter and CIA were hounding him. They'd even sit, sit, they'd sit at the next table. The agents would sit at the next table wherever he was in Africa and he would go and talk to the agents. Um, um, I'm not going to go on at great length about this. I'll just say a couple of things and then um, we go on in a larger group. But uh, John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy have been the most amazing of all to me because um, they don't fit my theology. Um, we're Catholic workers and the upper realm of the power structure doesn't fit it in, in, a, in a way it doesn't fit. I mean, in a way it, it should because <laughs> we need to stretch. But for myself, I have a prejudice against people of power. Um, so I think does um, um, well, so, so, so does the, the, the dimension that is seen from a scriptural point of view, but um, I have been truly amazed by studying their deaths and seeing that they were involved. Um, I mean, there are these two at the bottom in the in the 60s, or Malcolm's at the bottom, Martin not much farther up, and there are these two at the top, and there's a a process where they're in a way coming together, coming together in those years in the, in the early and the latter part of the 60s because they were working on complementary things, struggling, struggling, but struggling in a way that they, they heard each other and they responded to each other. And so uh, John Kennedy is being deeply influenced by King and even Malcolm, um, although Malcolm less so. And then at the end of his life, Robert Kennedy is profoundly influenced by King and vice versa. I was amazed to learn that the idea of the Poor People's Campaign came to a large degree from Robert Kennedy. You've heard of a woman named Marion Wright Edelman, Children's Defense Fund. In 1967, Marion Wright Edelman was Marion Wright and Peter Edelman. Marion Wright was a lawyer in Mississippi doing groundbreaking work with Martin Luther King with the poorest of the poor in Mississippi. Peter Edelman was a, co was a worker for Robert Kennedy and the two of them got together <laughs> as quiet mediation between King and Kennedy and in that process one day Peter Edelman and Marion Wright were sitting with Robert Kennedy at his home um, and Robert Kennedy said, you know, you know, he knew of course what Marion Wright was doing and where she was going the next day which was to be with Martin Luther King and he said, you know, the thing that really has to happen is if we're serious about eliminating poverty, 
We've just got to make it so unbearably hard for the legislature in, in the United States Congress that they can't do anything other than pass this legislation. And he said, you know, you know how to do it. She went the next day and talked to King about it. Now, King already had some ideas along that line, but Robert Kennedy was part of the genesis of all of that. I think I'm going to stop there and we can just sort of... The why of all of the, these events is far, far more important than who held what and what the angle of the shots was and all. I can talk about that. But the why is far, far more important. These people gave their lives and their lives were taken in plots that are extraordinarily complex and sophisticated and planned for a long way in advance and carried out in such a way with such cover-ups that we have to really work at getting the truth and yet the information is all out there and it is a scandal that it's up to people who are amateur investigators, namely citizen people like myself to have to uncover all of this. But the process on the other side the other side of the other side of the other side of the other side of the arms race where people give up their lives. That's an old story and an inspiring one and that's why I'm interested in all of this. The, the story that's told in the Gospels.